Happy Father's Day, dads. We do stumble in saying it, but uh, we mean it from our hearts, so thank you. And happy Father's Day. So here we go. I was going to say something, and I forgot what it was. <laughs> well, we're going to continue in our sermon series. And as we do, we're, we are uh, looking at this kind of a series of discovery. What does God think is very important as we return from a time of separation. As Judah returned to Jerusalem after the exile, what was important to God? And there's that word again, exile, a word you might not be so familiar with. You remember, remember the history after the promises to Abraham, he promised him land, he promised them children, he promised them that he would bless the world. Then the second great promise he made with Israel was to King David, and he promised him an eternal kingdom and a king on the throne forever and ever. And after David's reign, there was Solomon, and then over money, of course, they split in half, north and south, Israel in the north, Judah in the south, and they lived their separate but attached lives until the Assyrians came and conquered the north, scattered them away, never to be seen again, Eventually, the Babylonians capture the, or capture, they defeat the Assyrians, and they come and attack under Nebuchadnezzar and take Judah captive. They take the people to exile. They take them, and they move them back to Babylon, not back, they move them to Babylon. And in Babylon, they live for 70 years. The Persians defeat the Babylonians and as soon as they do that, they have a, a different foreign policy. So they say, okay, you can go back to your land. So they've been in, in uh, Babylon under Babylonian rule for 70 years. The Persians are now in charge, so they're back to their land. They come back in three waves, three different groups over a period of 100 years. And so they come back over with Zerubbabel, they come back with, with um, uh, Ezra, and then finally with Nehemiah. And so as they've come back... What does God really care about? I mean, this has been a long time. They, they have since rebuilt their homes. They have rebuilt the temple. It takes 25 years. They rebuild the walls. It takes 40 days or something like that in Nehemiah. But what does God really care about once they're back and settled in the land? And what does he care about from us? What stuff matters as we come back together? Well, Malachi opened with an exploration of the concept of cheap worship. Worship was just cheap to them. Next week, you might want to miss it, he's going to talk about marriage and the problems they were having in their marriages. And so between cheap worship and marriage, what's this in between? It's bad preaching. Come on, that can't be it. But the link is, is their priests weren't preaching properly. The priests had a low view of Scripture. And somehow the people had gotten the idea that their cheap worship and their struggle with, with their home life was either not sinful or they could just do what they wanted because God didn't really care anyway. Now, blaming the priests for the problem does not let the guilty off the hook. Just because you don't know about what the Bible says, that's on you too, not just me. Each person is still responsible for their sin, even if they're unaware of it. But the guilt was greater for those who did the preaching and the teaching. I can't wait <laughs> to see what God has to say to us in this text and what he's going to do in our lives. So if you have your Bibles, turn to Malachi chapter 2, the last book of the Old Testament, the one right before Matthew, Malachi chapter 2, verse 1. Do you have sermon notes? You do now. You have a QR code. You can and get them on your phone and fill them in as we go. You can be texting someone and no one will know the difference. <laughs> Guilt-free phone usage. I'm just taking sermon notes. But they're there, they'll be available every week, digital ones with the QR code. You can get your Bible on your phone. We just, you know, whatever, full service, whatever. So we're going to begin in Malachi chapter 2, verse 1, which starts rather simple. 
And now, you priests, this warning is for you. So does that mean if you're not a priest, you get a, a free Sunday this morning? Yeah, right. If you think that, you don't know me very well. The text probably is especially applicable to elders and the diaconate and teachers and leaders in this church family, but not quite so fast in that either. See, the problem with that kind of thinking is that this Old Testament term is used to describe every believer in the New Testament. Oh. See, the Old Testament priests were set aside to do what? They were set aside to do two things, to, to be involved in the sacrificial system and to serve God. Now, in the New Testament, Jesus comes along as the great high priest. He offers himself as that sacrifice for sin, and then things change forever. Hebrews 4.14, therefore, since we have a great high priest who has ascended to heaven, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold firmly to the faith we profess. we got a high priest. Chapter 7, verse 23 makes clear that Jesus has become a permanent high priest. We don't need this Old Testament priesthood. Hebrews 7.23, now there have been many of those priests since death prevented them from continuing in office. But because Jesus lives forever, he has a permanent priesthood. Therefore, he is able to save completely those who come to God through him because he always lives to intercede for them. And then in verse 27 of the same chapter, you know, they're they're really not necessary because these sacrifices aren't necessary. Unlike the other high priests, he does not need to offer sacrifices day after day, first for his own sins and then for the sins of the people. He sacrificed for their sins once for all, when he offered himself. So we no longer need this Old Testament priesthood. The New Testament, though, goes so far as to say, you know what, you all, the people, if you are a believer in Jesus, you're now in the priesthood. 1 Peter 2.9, but you are a chosen people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, God's special possession, What? That you may declare the praises of him who called you out of darkness and into his marvelous light. We don't have to offer sacrifices, but we do worship. We do serve. Revelation 1.6 puts it this way. He has made for us to be a kingdom and priests, to serve his God and Father. So when you come to Malachi 2, yes, this is directed specifically at the priests, but I think we have to listen Because in reality, we're all part of this New Testament priesthood. And so we have to ask ourselves, how much are we like those priests? What do we do that's like them? What do we think that's like them? Do we ever default like they did, that church and worship and ministry is just a drudge, it's a drag, it's routine? (laughs) Well, we, we don't do that right? Yeah. So so maybe the text isn't just for like elders and me. Maybe it's for all of us. And we should listen extra carefully if, if we're a leader because we're a royal priesthood. And we lead people to God and we worship that amazing Father. So in this section of Malachi, What is the stuff that concerns God as we return? The answer is rather simple. Here you go. You want it in a sentence? Here it is. God cares that we know the truth, and God cares that we live the truth. That's it. God wants you to know truth, and he wants you to live truth. And as they returned to Jerusalem, God cared whether or not they actually obeyed what his word told them to do. God cared that they had a high view of the scripture, that they trusted it, they lived it, they believed it, and then they they lived it. To drive that message home, Malachi answers a couple of questions. How did they fail to live and teach the truth? And then how can we succeed in living and doing the truth? So let's start at, 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 at the negative this morning. Malachi points out five flaws that they were doing that contributed to their spiritual slide that they really shouldn't have been doing. And then he's going to show some ways to return correctly. So what were their fatal flaws? There were five of them. 
And as we look at Malachi 2, we're going to be introduced to these leaders that exhibited conduct that wasn't becoming of their profession. And they did it because they thought, that, you know, it doesn't matter. We're the priests. We can do and say what we want. So what did they do? Number one, they dishonored the holiness of God. They dishonored God's holiness, verses 2 and 3. See, the first step to, to disobedience is always a, a superficial religion. It always starts there. A.W. Tozer said, what you think about God is the most important thing about you. What's your view of God that, that's going to color everything? And these priests, they no longer honored God, which means they didn't consider him to be weighty or significant. It's just another side part of life. Verse 2, he was so insignificant to them, they didn't even listen to him. If you do not listen, and if you do not resolve to honor my name, says the Lord Almighty. Listen, you got to get to hear intelligently. You need to hear with the implication that I'm going to do what he says. You have to resolve. That's, an, that's a decision of the will. I am going to do what God wants me to do. And in Malachi 1, we know they didn't honor God because they were giving garbage on the sacrifices. And now they decided not to honor his name. And what is that name? Here it is again. We saw it so many times last week. Lord Almighty. In our text, it occurs four more times. He is the self-existent one with an, a host, with thousands of armies of angels that will do whatever he wants and whatever he tells them to do. But they didn't care. They're bored with it all. And they yawned in the face of that God. And yet because of his love and his grace, he offers them a way back. What's the first word? Chapter, uh, chapter 2, verse 2. If, here's a condition. If you persist in sliding south, yeah, I will punish you. Jeremiah 13, 20, 13, 16 says, Give glory to the Lord your God before he brings the darkness before your feet. Stumble on the darkening hills. If they decide to give God the glory and do what is right and decide to honor his name, he will unleash his blessings. And Malachi becomes very graphic at this point. He says, if you do not grasp the greatness of God, and if you don't honor his heaviness, his weight, his significance, three things are going to happen to you. Number one, he will rebuke you. Verse, last half of verse two. I will send a curse on you and I will curse your blessings. Yes, I have already cursed them because you have not resolved to honor me. He's going to send curses. We, you know, we don't use the word curses all that much anymore. We do it, maybe. I'm just kidding. But we, we don't, th this concept of curses is not something that, that is really in what we think about all the time. It's, it's not just wishing harm on somebody else. It, it has power of doom and destruction. And the word says, I'm going to send it. He's going to hurl it. He's going to let it loose. And when God says he's going to curse their blessings, what is he saying? He's saying, this is going to be so bad. You can stand and do your blessings and all this stuff, but it's not going to help. You cannot bless yourself out of this mess. And verse 3 begins with some very tough words aimed at their children and their grandchildren. He says, because of you, I will rebuke your descendants. Some translations you have might say seed, and it could literally be seed. Their crops might fail in, in the coming um, years. Seed is a very literal translation, but he's talking to the priests. So it's most likely it could be their crops, but it's probably their children. It's probably similar to what God did back in the first pages of 1 Samuel when he removed Eli as being the priest and his sons because of their their sin. And so therefore, their descendants don't get to be priests. And I think that's, that's kind of the concept here. The, the, the way you live today affects your children today and tomorrow. And it's probably something we ought to think more about, not less. Are we living in light of the legacy we will leave for our children, for our grandchildren? 
They face rebuke if they don't change. Second, he says, they face rejection. Now, I hope you haven't just eaten breakfast because this gets a little picturesque, shall we say. He says, I will smear on your faces the dung from your festival sacrifices and you will be carried off with it. Okay, so we need an explanation here. Maybe you don't, but I'm going to give one. These post-exilic prophets, they don't mince mince words. Zechariah says the same thing. Here's the picture. As part of the ritual sacrifice, they would slice open the animal. They'd have to take out the unclean parts, the intestines, the all whatever. And then normally what they would do is they would take it from that place of sacrifice. They have to take it outside the camp where they would destroy it, burn it, whatever they did with it. And then now they're kind of bloody and messy. So they have to go themselves and wash themselves, purify themselves before they can come back in. That's the normal way to get rid of the unclean parts of the animal. But this is a little bit worse. He says in the NIV, you know, I'm going to smear dung on your face. It's the word offal, O-F-F-A-L, offal. And it refers not just to the intestines, but to the manure. It's awful, awful. (laughs) You got that? God is saying, because you priests are not honoring my holiness, I'm going to give you a manure makeover. It's not just on their clothes. It's on their faces. He's going to take poop from the sick animals and put it on their face. Imagine these self-righteous religious leaders with that on their face. God's not going to tolerate wimpy, careless worship. It's a serious matter to attempt to speak for God or to serve in his name. Nahum puts it this way, I will pelt you with filth. I will treat you with contempt and make you a spectacle. They're going to be rebuked. They're going to be rejected. And finally, he says, you're going to be removed, which is kind of the whole point of this. Because this rebuke is going to lead to a rejection, and it's going to lead, ultimately, they're removed from their service. Because when the priest cleaned out all the offal, they were supposed to throw it over the wall and burn it because it was unclean. But now it's on their faces. How do you do that? You don't do that. They're now unclean. They're barred from the, from the sanctuary, the temple, the place of meeting. They cannot come back. Their ministry was over. And this had to have overwhelmed the priests who listened to Malachi. He is saying, the reality is, guys, you are unclean. You're disqualified. You're not welcome in the house of God anymore. And Malachi says when God removes them, they're going to know that it was God who did it, not just some raving lunatic prophet. The last part of verse 3 says, and they will be carried off with it. Do not be passive with your treatment of the name of God. He's not going to allow anyone to prosper for long in any form of rebellion to his known will. Why? Why? Malachi 1.1, I have loved you, says the Lord. He loves us too much just to leave us to our own devices. We have to come back to a proper understanding of a holy love that God has for us. The first fatal flaw, it is the longest. Rest easy, the rest will go fast. First fatal flaw, they dishonored the holiness of God. Second fatal flaw, they departed from the way. Skip down to verse 8, the first phrase. The the, the first step is always this disregard for the weightiness of God. And then it says in verse 8, but you have turned from the way. The New Living Translation says you have left God's paths. And once you stop with your honoring of God, you're going to leave his paths. And if you're the leader, then everybody else is going to have trouble too. They've departed from the way. They're going to be lost. Third thing, they were destructive to others. Because when we depart the way, normally we end up taking other people with us. 
and by your teaching have caused many to stumble. We all influence someone when we grow cold. Bad company corrupts good moral, or bad company corrupts good character. The priests weren't walking with God, and because they weren't, what they said caused the people to waver. Instead of pointing them up at God, they were tripping them up. Isaiah 9, 16, those who guide this people mislead them, and those who are guided are led astray. Jesus had no tolerance for this. Remember Matthew 18. He said, but if anyone causes one of these little ones who believe in me to sin, it would be better for him to have a large millstone hung around his neck and be drowned into the depths of the sea. This isn't limited to those teaching Sunday school folks. The whole imagery as Matthew's arguing this gospel is that you come to him with childlike faith. So if you mislead people who have come to Christ in childlike faith, woe to you. A lot of our churches ought to be named Millstone Harbor Church because they're just leading people astray. Fourth thing, they desecrated the covenant. God had this special rapport with the priests. Went all the way back to Levi. And he says, you have violated the covenant with Levi, says the Lord Almighty. See, they were allowing their, re their religious practice to really rupture their relationship with God. Now, where's the covenant with Levi? You're right, there isn't one that we can actually point to. So what's going on here? Well, Levi was the son of Jacob, not a priest. There was no covenant laid out for the tribe of Levi, or the Levites. But because God chose the tribe of Levi in their, in their wandering days to, to be the priestly tribe, that choice became known as this covenant with Levi. So what's an Old Testament covenant? Well, it's a covenant that God says, I'm going to call my people, I'm going to bless them, and I'm going to give them obligations to do, and we'll, it all begins with a sacrifice. Without no sacrifice, there's no covenant. And so God called the tribe of Levi to service. He gave them wonderful blessings of ministry. He laid out their obligations and their arrangements. It's all there in, in the Old Testament. And then it did begin in Leviticus 8 with a sacrifice. I think that's what's meant by the covenant with Levi, the ministry of the priests among them. Their role in the nation was to produce in the people such a heart and love for God. But they weren't doing that. They had violated the covenant, Malachi says. I mean, this means they let it decay. They destroyed it. They corrupted it. That word is used in Genesis 6. God saw how corrupt the earth had become for all the people on earth had corrupted their ways. They desecrated the covenant. They were not leading people to love God. Fifth and final fatal flaw here in this text is they were despised by the people. You do that, then the people didn't like you either. It's ironic. They allowed substandard sacrifices so that what? So probably so the people would like them. Don't make me bring my good one. Okay, you can kind of bring the bad one. Because they didn't want the people to get mad at them. They cared more about what people thought of them than what God thought of them. And so as they're in this spiritual free fall, what happens? They, they end up being despised by the people. Verse 9, so you have caused so I have caused you to be despised and humiliated before all the people because you have not followed my ways but have shown partiality in matters of the law. The sham is over, he says. The gig is up. Listen to me. When we don't take our relationship with God seriously, then no one is going to take us seriously or their relationship with God seriously either. And the problem today is that people have seen just enough Sunday morning religion to vaccinate them against any desire of a relationship with God. And that's sad. If you want to know what God cares about, here's five fatal flaws. Don't do this. Now, on the more positive side of things, how do we succeed? It's there in Malachi. How can we succeed in caring about the things that God cares about? Number one, we must respond to God in obedience. God wants us to listen. He says it in the negative, but turn it around. 
Verse 2, if you do not listen and if you do not resolve to honor my name. So the, the positive command is you need to listen and you need to resolve, make a decision to honor my name. He's asking them to listen to God. He's asking them to do what God has told them to do. See, it's one thing to believe something is true. It is quite something else altogether to actually do it. James 1.22 in the message, don't fool yourself into thinking that you're a listener when you're anything but letting the word go in one ear and out the other. You need to act on what you hear. I love Samuel's heart as a little boy. And God is speaking to him. He's calling out to him in the middle of the night. And finally he responds and says, Speak, Lord, for your servant is listening. Is that your heart as we return? Speak to me, God. I'm listening. Second thing, how do we succeed? We must revere God as awesome. Verses 4 and 5. God is longing for this covenant with Levi to continue. He says in verse 4, And you will know that I have sent you this warning so that my covenant with, with Levi may continue. I want it to continue, says the Lord Almighty. Here he is, Levi, the third son born uh, to Leah from Jacob. You know what his name literally means? It means to adhere or to be joined to. And apparently, what Leah was hoping was that this kid would be a bond between her and Jacob. That would be drawn closer. Genesis 29, 34 says, Now at last my husband will become attached to me. So he was named Levi. Uh, that wasn't a great marriage, apparently. It reveals a desire all wives have to be attached to their husbands, to be locked into them. What's interesting, though, is there's really no formal covenant arranged in the Old Testament. In fact, not that much is said of a positive nature about Levi. Read, the, read Genesis 49, where the, the, you know, they catalogs the blessings. <laughs> Not such a great thing about Levi. So, so what made the followers of Levi so special? Well, Malachi 2.5 describes this covenant relationship. My covenant was with him, a covenant of life and peace. Hmm. And I gave them to him. This called for reverence, and he revered me and stood in awe of my name. It seems that this covenant of life and, and peace is a reference to what Phineas did in Numbers 25. You know Phineas. In Numbers 25, he took a stand against evil. The people of Israel were, were doing things they really shouldn't do sexually. Okay? There was all kinds of sexual immorality going on, and it involved the worship of Baal. And God's anger burned against the people. So he told Moses to, to, you know, if they're doing this, kill them, destroy them, get them out of the camp. And even as many were being wiped out in broad daylight, a guy named Zimri brought a Midianite prostitute named Cosby into his tent and did their thing. And Phineas saw this. And he jumps up. What does he do? He takes a spear and... They didn't do it anymore. <laughs> and the plague is stopped at the cost of 24,000 Israeli lives. But God is moved by what Phineas did. And Numbers 25 says that because he was zealous for my name, I should read that exactly, because you can read it behind me. He was as zealous as I am for my honor among them. Therefore, tell him I am making my covenant of peace with him. Down in verse 13, he kind of summarizes what's referenced, I think, in Malachi 2. He and his descendants will have a covenant of a lasting priesthood because he was zealous for the honor of his God and made atonement for the Israelites. See, with someone like Phineas in your family tree, it's a little bit of an anomaly that they were allowing to happen in Malachi's day what they were. But if we're honest, a lot of us, we push the corners. We play little church games. We compromise. We disobey. 
right in the face of a holy God. And if we would revere God as awesome, we would be changed forever, without a doubt. See, so many people are bored with God because we don't understand who he really is. And because we do not honor his holiness, we lose sight of what's really important. We've got to revere his holiness. Third, we must resolve to lead ourselves. They respond to God. They revere him as awesome. Then you've got to lead yourself, he says. Verse 6, true instruction was in his mouth and nothing false was found on his lips. He walked with me in peace and righteousness. He, they, these ancient Levites, they made the truth real in their lives. And if we want to lead people upward, we've got to make sure that the word of God is penetrating our own heart first. We've got to concentrate on our own walk with Christ before we worry about other people's walk with Christ. Jesus will say it on the Sermon on the Mount, take the log out of your own eye first. Then you can do this other stuff, but, but watch yourself. Fourth, we must repel people from sin. See, part of the challenge in verse 6 is, you know, you, they just let people do what they want. When you do whatever it takes, though, to follow Christ, you're going to turn many from their sin. When we see someone straying that might be tempted, to, we just want to turn the other way and let them go. But James 5 exhorts us, don't do that. He says, my brothers, if one of you should wander from the truth and someone should bring him back, remember this, whoever turns a sinner from the error of his ways will save him from death and cover up over a multitude of sins. Who's deliberately disobeying that you know about and yet we just don't deal with it? What phone call do you need to make this week? What visit do you need to make? As if we're, we're honoring God the significance of the holy name of God, we should be repelling people from sin. Fifth, we must represent God to others. Verse 7, one of the roles of the priest is, is to represent, a go-between, and reveal his will to the people. We see this in, in, the last, in the first part of verse 7. He says, for the lips of a priest ought to preserve knowledge, preserve, guard against perversion, keep it true. In order to do that, you've got to remain in the presence of God. You've got to know God. And it goes back to responding and revering Him. The last part of verse 7, And from His mouth men should seek instruction, because He is the messenger of the Lord Almighty. They ought to want to hear from us. Which begs a question, does it not? Are we making people thirsty for God by the way that we live? If we're living our faith out loud, people are going to notice and they're going to begin to talk to us and seek instruction from us. 1 Peter 3, you know it, but, your heart, but in your heart set apart Christ as Lord. Revere his name. Always be prepared to give an answer to anyone who asks you to give the reason for the hope that you have with gentleness and respect. So, Malachi 2, this hinge passage what are the implications to our faith? I mean, God cares last week that we treat him like God. God cares this week that we obey the whole counsel of God. Look at the last three verses of our text. For the lips of a priest ought to preserve knowledge. Down in verse 9, because you have not followed my ways, but have shown partiality. There it is. The lips of the priest, the lips of my spokesman ought to preserve knowledge. You've got to know the truth but you have not followed my ways. You did your own thing. Don't tell me you know the truth if you're not following in what I tell you to do. Teach the word and live the life. And here's your problem. Hebrews 5 says, you know, you really should all be teachers by now. All teachers. You need someone to teach you the elementary truths of God's word all over again? <laughs> this is for all of us. So what's the implication? Three. I'll go, no, I won't go quick, but I might. You never know. It impacts our view of history and tradition. If we're really going to live the word, it views 
it's, it, it, it colors how we view history and tradition. It means we've got to respect history, but we're not bound by it. J.I. Packer would say that church history is like one long Bible study from, from Augustine to Aquinas to Anselm to Luther to Calvin to Spurgeon and all the others. And we ought to respect what they had to say and what they've learned. Which is why sometimes we quote the Apostles' Creed. But Luther came to the conviction that he must put the infallible word of God over the popes and the councils and the church fathers and the tradition. He said at one point, unless I am convinced by testimonies of scripture or by evident reason, for I believe neither the pope nor the councils alone, since it is established that they have often erred and contradicted themselves, I am the prisoner of the scriptures cited by me, and my conscience has been taken captive by the word of God. I can stand here and do no other. God, help me. Second, it impacts our view of, of morals. The Bible alone provides a foundation for standing against the moral decline of our culture. If the Bible isn't our source for morality, then the question begs itself, then what is? You see, the Christian worldview is based on two things. Number one, God exists. There is a God. And number two, God has spoken in his word. And if these two foundation truths are the starting point for our worldview, then we need to live it out. If they're not, then we're trying to find objectivity in, in a sea of subjectivity. Because what is the ruling class of the world saying these days? How is it ruled? How do you make decisions of morality? By social, uh, by social um, what's the word I'm looking for? Con consensus. Because our morality in the world today is being changed by all those around us. It's being shaped. Look at the moral changes that we have undergone in this nation in the last 50 years. We're living in shifting sand. That's the state of modern morality. The Babylon Bee tweeted this morning. It was hysterical. I kind of thought it was true, so I, 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 I researched. I have sources. They said this. The nation says, to, uh, see, their tweet says, nation spends day acknowledging existence of a completely unnecessary parent. It's Father's Day. Then they had this made-up quote. I believed it, actually, because I don't think it's all that far off. This fictitious person said that fathers exist at all is insulting. That they're around at all seems to imply that women could use help running a family, which simply isn't true. Still, it is a fact that they currently exist, so I guess it's okay to spend one day acknowledging the fact that as long as it's not too big a deal, is made of it. It, it. it sounds so much like our culture. Today you get to shove your fist in the face and the hand of the potter who made you. And by fiat and surgery change your sex. Where's God in that equation? We have followed the road into the swamp. How will we ever get out? Today, nothing can be wrong. Therefore, everything is right, which is perfect nonsense. When you turn away from the Scripture, you are left with moral chaos. You know that. But does your Scripture, does the Bible really anchor your daily life? I'm not going to rail against social issues. It, you, can, you can do that, but, but what is the Word doing in your life this week? Third, it impacts our view of the way of salvation. That's the keynote of the whole Re Reformation. Luther and those who followed him declared that salvation, it was not in the church, it isn't in the councils, but it's in Christ and Christ alone. The Bible doesn't save you. The gospel of Jesus Christ saves you. So where do you find the Bible? Or where do you find the gospel? It's, it's in the book. The issue as, return, as we return is this, God has spoken. And if God has spoken, did he speak truth? And if he spoke truth, where do we find it? Malachi, I think, argues for a very high view of scripture. We believe it to be divinely inspired, verbally true, 
every word. And if we take Malachi seriously, then we must say that the great need of believers everywhere is to become truly biblical in our thinking. What does God care about? As we search the scriptures, we become then people of the word. Oh, may God make us people of the word. May he make this church a church of the word. May, may he make our families built on the word. Men and women who love the word. And don't miss this. Outward success is never the final measure of any church or any Christian. We're not safe because we're busy or have a nice building. Do we need to be busy? Yes, we need great programs to grow together. A nice building's great, a balanced budget. But just as in the days of Nehemiah and Malachi, it is not enough to build the outward to protect ourselves against attack. The inner commitment to the Word of God is just as important. And if that is not there, the outer walls will not protect us anyway. We need spiritual resources to fight a spiritual battle. We need the Word of God. And many of our problems arise from some basic mistakes in the Christian life. One of them, <laughs> we just ignore the Word. We believe that He's there. We sort of believe He's spoken. But if He has, we need to get back to the book. The challenge of Malachi is this. Will you listen to the book? And will you live the book? Let's pray. Father, Malachi speaks in a day that, man, the more you look at it, the more it's like today. Help us listen to him. Help us want to listen to him. That we might do what he has to say. We love you and we love your word. And we want to be overwhelmed by an amazing, awesome Lord of hosts, God. In Jesus' name, amen.